Martin here. I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina here at the Civil Rights Museum where, of course, we're going to have our broadcast here with the American Heart Association initiative they have uh, with, of course, uh, five black HBCUs. I'm going to explain to you exactly what that initiative is. Uh, but our top story we'll be dealing with, of course, is the death of John Singleton. That is the Academy-nominated director passed away today at the age of 51 due to a stroke. We'll hear from folks who knew him well, including directors Mario Van Peebles, uh, Bill Duke, as well as Maddie Rich. Now, Singleton died of a stroke, a condition that kills African Americans at twice the rate of whites. We'll talk to a doctor here uh, with the American Heart Association about stroke, what it means, and the impact, of course, on African Americans. Also, another passing of a legendary African American, this time federal judge Damon J. Keith out of Detroit. Uh, he, of course, a, a lion in the legal industry, studied under Thurgood Marshall at Howard University, uh, passed away yesterday at the age of 96. We'll talk to Spencer Overton, who is the president for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, uh, who clerked under uh, Judge Keith to talk about uh, his life, his impact, and the role that he played when it comes to the legal profession over the last 50 years. Also on today's show, uh, as I said, we'll also uh, share also uh, more of the uh, discussion here uh, in Charlotte. North Carolina with what the American Heart Association is doing with HBCUs and so we look forward to that conversation and also after we finish our broadcast we're going to actually be live streaming the event here where five HBCUs are competing for uh, a year long health grant as well and so we've got uh, a jam packed show for you folks it's time to bring the funk I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered let's go he's got it. whatever the miss he's on it whatever it is All right, folks, Roland Martin here. Today is Monday, April 29, 2019. I'm broadcasting live from the International Civil Rights Museum here uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, where we, of course, will be uh, uh, live streaming our event uh, in an hour uh, in a partnership with American Heart Association. But first, we'll deal with our breaking news story. That is the death of John Singleton, the director of Boys in the Hood, Baby Boy, uh, of course, uh, Four Brothers, so many other different films. Uh, he passed away today after his family took him off life support uh, in Los Angeles. He checked himself into the hospital uh, a couple of weeks ago, complaining of problems with in his leg after returning from a trip. Uh, and then, of course, initially they said it was a mild stroke, but now we know that it was a severe stroke he suffered. And the decision was made by his family to remove him from life support. He passes away at the age of 51. The outpouring of love and affection for John Singleton has been enormous. Many of the folks who work with him on screen and off screen have been talking about his life, his impact, and what he meant to the film profession. Remember, he was just uh, 24 years old when he was nominated for the first African-American for Best Director for Boys in the Hood. In fact, uh, Spike Lee posted on Instagram that the moment uh, John Singleton came up to him and said, I'm going to be a filmmaker, he said he knew in his spirit uh, that he was actually going to do exactly what he was destined to do. Uh, he went on, of course, to direct, to direct a number of films. Uh, in addition, uh, executive produced foot movies. He also had a show on uh, the FX network that he had been uh, working on the last two years. And so John Singleton, a major force uh, in the film industry. And so, uh, in fact, folks, uh, here's just some of the comments that we have been uh, looking at. Folks have been talking about uh, his films. And again, uh, those films include uh, Poetic Justice, Higher Learning, Rosewood, Shaft, as I said, Baby Boy, Too Fast, Too Furious, uh, Four Brothers, uh, Hustle and Flow, which of course led to Academy Award nominations uh, for uh, Terrence Howard as well as Taraji P. Henson. Uh, and uh, for just, just a tour de force, a tour de force. Uh, again, here are a sampling of some of those tweets. Uh, Peter Ramsey, John, you were a kind and supportive friend, a loving father, a 
passionate and committed artist. You truly li lived your life to the fullest. You didn't just make your dreams come true, but those of so many other people. So Godspeed with all love and gratitude. Um, Keisha Sharp, who stars in an, uh, a show on uh, Fox, uh, she said, I hold John Singleton in my thoughts and prayers. I pray for his family and friends for their recovery at this time as their loving father, brother, son uh, flies to a better place. I love working with this warm and talented man. We will meet again. Uh, and again, uh, folks, just uh, all kind of folks. This is what Taraji P. Henson, what she posted on Instagram. Uh, and this actually, this actually took place on Saturday. Visited you today. Me and Tyrese prayed so hard over you. You heard my voice and jumped up. Uh, I have hope and faith because I know that hashtag God is. Keep praying, everybody, for our beloved John Singleton. Again, that was what she posted on Saturday. Uh, Tyrese also made a lengthy post on his Instagram TV uh, account. You really should go look at that. And he talked about uh, that he was supposed to fly to London. He said, but something in his spirit said that he needed to go see John Singleton that day because if he returned, from his trip, uh, John, he would, may, would not be able to see him. And so he said he turned to his wife and she says, baby, you need to go do it. And so he then went to the hospital uh, and where he met up with Taraji Henson. He says in his post, there were a number of other people who were in the hospital who were crying, who were laughing, telling stories about working with John Singleton. Uh, and he said, quote, uh, and he typed this uh, on his note section on his iPhone on this flight back to London and I, uh, and I just can't sleep. My heart is heavy. There's a feeling in my chest that just won't go away 27 years my brother our brother and family uh, in about an hour i'm about to tell you guys for the first time ever how the movie baby boy happened if anybody is down for a good detailed story stick around praying hard for you john you're not just love you're beloved and all of this hurts again if you go to tyrese's instagram account or his igtv uh, feed you'll actually see this lengthy post uh, set to music well, you can actually hear what he had to uh, say describing the relationship, uh, how John Singleton came to his home and told him that he needed to be in Baby Boy, made him read the script cover to cover, sitting at his table. Uh, and so it is an amazing, amazing story. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, meet John Singleton on many occasions, interviewed him uh, at the American Black Film Festival in 2017, not only for my then TV One show, News One Now, but also on stage, the closing session there, uh, they always do a major Q&A with the director, uh, and I was chosen by uh, Jeff and Nicole Friday to do the interview uh, with John Singleton, and so we're going to have uh, some of that a little bit later for you, but right now we want to turn to uh, some folks who knew him well. First off uh, is Mario Van Peebles, longtime director and producer. Uh, Mario, w welcome back to Roller Martin Unfiltered. <coughs> Brother, thanks for having me on. I, I remember when I first met John, I was at Warner Brothers, and I had my first feature called New Jack City that I'd just gotten the deal to direct. And I came out of the office, and there was a young brother there, he had on a school jacket, I'll never forget. And he introduced himself, he said, I'm, my name is John Singleton. I said, my brother, I'm Mario Van Peebles. And we started talking, and he said, I've got this script, Boys in the Hood, and I said, I just got this script, New Jack City. And it was a new time for us as filmmakers, and we both got out there, and uh, New Jack came out, and we did our thing, and then Boys in the Hood came out, and I got to know him over the years as a man, as a filmmaker, but also as a father. Both John and I love being dads, and we would get together and talk as much about being fathers, because that was one of the best roles I ever got to play, was being a father, uh, and we talk about being fathers, being being loving black fathers, and the different kind of souls that you your, your kids your kids come in with, and how to raise them, and how to read to them, and how to talk to them. So we talked about as much as filmmaking. We talked about sailing. We talked about fatherhood. We talked about it all. Um, Mario, you mentioned New Jack City. Uh, and the reality is uh, one of your producers of that film. Uh, we lost him at the age of 42 to right. a stroke, George Jackson. Uh, yeah. John Singleton, 51 years old. And so uh, as, as somebody who is very health conscious like yourself, very much about the environment as well, uh, it, it, it must be difficult. I made a post earlier. Luther Vandross was 54 years old. Uh, Barry White was 58 years old. And I mentioned George as well, uh, losing just the immensely talented individuals at such young ages. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things we understand is that, um, you know, as we as we grow older, as we grow 
it, it's got a lot to do with our genetics, but it also has a lot to do with our habits and how we handle stress in particular. And I think sometimes, especially for, for black folks, you know, that, you know, some people would say, well, we still suffer from post-slavery, post-Jim Crow syndrome. We suffer things that, that, are, that are not always tangible that folks can see. And John went through a lot, as I know I did, and, and of course our parents did. So we, we, when you are in a business where you are not going to be uh, judged by your peers, um, you don't control the outcome. You know, when you're, you're doing something like what we're doing, where you're not just acting, but you're directing and writing and so much of, and you're trying to get the financing. There's so many elements that I think can be stressful that I think a lot of how we age is how we process stress. You know, you got to make effort to dance. In fact, in fact, in, in fact, Mario, in, yeah, in, in fact, Mario, I want to reference. Uh, I want to reference an Instagram post uh, that John put up on January fifteenth, uh, and this was when everybody was doing all those ten-year uh, challenges, two thousand eight, two thousand eighteen. Right. Uh, right. And there was a photo of him in two thousand eight, very serious. There's a photo of him in two thousand eighteen on a boat, uh, smiling, and he said this here. He said, two thousand eight, I was too serious. Uh, ten years later, two twenty eighteen, I'm all about living my best good life no stress yes. that speaks to what you yes. were just saying yeah yeah so i th i saw him that's interesting because towards the last couple times i saw him he was starting to say i've got to find time to find time for me you know to to live my best life and to find time to to look back and process all this and say man we you know my dad always said it too my dad said we tend to focus so much on the future Every now and then, you got to stop and really enjoy today. Having said that, I don't know the details of his situation, but a lot of us, of course, grow up in places with food deserts. There's no, there's not a lot of health food. There's not a lot of fresh food. We kill ourselves with our knives and our forks. And I'm not speaking to John, but a lot of us as a people uh, don't understand how, you know, we're we're not only getting substandard housing. Sometimes we're getting substandard diets and substandard living conditions. So we really have to make an effort yep. to love and laugh and take care of ourselves, Roland. Now, having said that, I'm definitely not perfect, brother. <laughs> I, I, I'm a, of I'm course, a I understand. In, I'm, a vegan in between, I'm a vegan between meals. <laughs> so but when it comes to the time to eat. I understand. You know, man, but I, but I, well, I definitely well, make an effort, you know. And, and here's the thing. The other thing I'll just say about John is this. The brother got so much done. Look at that list you just read to us. You know, it's it's a yeah, tragedy right, to right. pass early, but it's a definitely a tragedy to not come here to be incarnate in this body to do some of what you came to do. And I know Brother John did a lot of what he came to do. Not all of it. You know, we lost him way too early. But I'm going to tell you, this brother got a lot done. He made a difference. Absolutely. Mario Van Peebles, we certainly appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, folks. Right now, I want to turn to uh, another director, someone uh, who knew John Singleton well, uh, Bill Duke. Uh, Bill Duke, how you doing? You know, still breathing over there. Is this, Bill there? But, um, glad to be here today. Can you hear me? Uh, Bill, can I, you can, hear I me? can hear you. Uh, first and foremost, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear you. All right. Uh, Bill, first and foremost, just uh, your thoughts on the passing of John Singleton. I, um, I'm speechless, you know. Um, I think we all love John. Um, and uh, at 51, it's just shocking. Um, he was a pioneer, you know, like Michael... Schultz and Spike and Robert Townsend and the Hughes brothers and many others who gave a voice to the voiceless, you know. Um, his first films, were, you know, the media always made the kids in the inner city look like these sociopathic monsters, and he gave them their voice of humanity. Does that make any sense? No, it absolutely makes sense. And I think when you talk about uh, him also being a student of a film, I mean, he was he was always a very serious uh, person. Uh, I, I read from what Spike Lee's post on Instagram when he said the moment he met him, he said, when he said, I am going to be a filmmaker, he said, a lot of people walk up to me and they say that. He said, but I could look in his eye, the intensity in his eye knew exactly that he was going to do what he said he was going to do. Yes. And he was, he was a great human being, too, you know. Um, 
he was a great person. Um, he was not egocentric. No matter how much he accomplished, he was he was a hungry human being. He wanted to do better and more all the time. And he didn't just do, you know, stuff that was surface. You know, John always wanted to do something that had meaning. I, I, call, I call his films edutainment. They're entertaining, but they give you something to think about and feel. And uh, you leave with a sense of his understanding of our mutual humanity. So we're going to miss him, you know. Uh, Bill Duke, I uh, certainly appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much for uh, joining us. Talk about uh, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. God bless. Me. All right. One of the, a very young filmmaker uh, made a movie called Straight Out of Brooklyn called Maddie Rich. Uh, Maddie uh, has been on the West Coast for some time. He joins us right now. Maddie, how you doing? I'm doing good, Roland. Good to um, speak uh, with you. Um, you know, feeling really bad about the, the loss of our brother, uh, John Singleton, who's always been a, a role model for me to look up to. And um, we met... In 1991, uh, New York Times did the iconic uh, cover with black directors, and John was there, and myself, Bill Duke, Mara Van Peebles, Spike, uh, and the Hutland brothers. And I gravitated towards uh, John uh, from, uh, you know, learning about Boys in the Hood and him learning about my first film, Stride of Brooklyn. And he was from South L.A. I was from Red Hood Projects in Brooklyn, and we just... I just connected with him on so many different levels. Uh, and uh, even when I moved uh, from Brooklyn to Hollywood and I had a deal at Sony Studios, he was already on the lot with a deal. And he would sit me down you know, over lunch and, and teach me the game of uh, producing and directing uh, commercial films. Uh, and mm -hmm. There's just... Not enough that I can say about this man. I mean, I've seen him so, so many times at the Directors Guild annual dinner uh, not too long ago this year, and uh, he's always been encouraging to me. And that's just a testament of the man. Uh, outside of being an iconic filmmaker, making classic movies, but also being an advocate, Roland, of, for us in front of the camera, in behind the camera, as we can see on television with his series and, and in his, his films. So he will always be missed. Well, Absolutely. Well, I think, I think if you look at, again, some of the tributes pouring in, folks talked about, uh, again, his impact, not only for the people who he put in the films, but just like what Spike Lee did, the people who he put uh, behind the camera, the folks who went on to work on other television shows, uh, other movies, people who are writers, uh, who work on the technical side. I mean, that's also uh, something that's critically important to understand. It is, because he didn't have to do that. And this was a testament of, of who John Singleton uh was is he when i say an advocate and he was an advocate and i know many people who he worked with behind the scenes where he advocated for us to be a part of these major feature films you know crew members and you know uh talent in front of the camera uh i can just tell you from just the advice that he's given me before i directed the, the inkwell uh on just the studio system you know i was coming from making an independent film to learning what mm -hmm. it is to, to deal with, you know, the corporate structure of Hollywood. And he knew that very well. So that's that's who he was, was he he wasn't uh, a egocentric, a centrical kind of a person. He, he, he was a very humble man, uh, but had vision. He had strong vision. And he told our stories, the stories that matter to those living in South L.A. or those, you know, living anywhere. Uh, uh, the stories that studios would probably didn't even think that economically would make money. And then he showed us right. and showed right. them that these, our stories do make money. Well, Maddie Rich, we certainly appreciate you joining us uh, on Roller Martin Unfiltered, uh, sharing your thoughts about uh, John Singleton, the passing of John. Uh, thanks so much, man. Thank you. Uh, folks, as I said earlier, I talked about several prominent African-Americans who have passed away as a result of stroke. John Singleton, 51. You heard me talk with Mario Van Peebles about uh, film director and producer George Jackson at 42. Luther Vandross uh, passed away from complications from his stroke uh, at 54. Of course, also Barry White 
uh, 58 years old. But how, how are African Americans more impacted by strokes than anyone else? Joining us right now is Dr. James Allred, cardiologist with the Cone Health Medical Group. And of course, we're here uh, in Greensboro for this American Heart Association uh, event. Uh, and uh, we're supposed to be talking about, of course, this HBCU initiative uh, dealing with the reality of health outcomes for African Americans. Uh, and this story's uh, happened and sort of collided. And so, for, for the folks who don't uh, know, what exactly is a stroke? That's a great question. I think a perfect question because so many people listening, you know, we, we have no idea what a stroke is. So uh, basically, a stroke is like a heart attack, but of the brain. The brain doesn't get adequate blood flow. And lots of things can cause a stroke. Um, often it's a blockage of an artery going to the, vein, to the brain. And because the, the arteries to the brain are so small, these blockages can come from multiple sources. And in fact, um, uh, the initial reporting was that uh, John Singleton had returned from a trip, was complaining about problem with his leg, and checked himself into the hospital. Right. Yeah, so you know, we have seen cases, you know, I'm not speaking as to Understand. this particular case, but we've seen cases where you could have a blood clot in your leg. For example, they could travel to your heart and because of a small hole that some people will have in their heart, about 20, 25% of people have a little small hole between the upper chambers of their heart, that clot could actually travel to the brain and cause a stroke. Not saying, again, that that's what happened right, right. here. I don't have access to that kind of information, but that's something we see sometimes. Um, high blood pressure, hypertension is a real cause for stroke. In fact, there was a woman uh, who at the, my church in Houston, um, she actually had a spike in her blood pressure that caused her stroke. It, right. her, her blood, I mean, she was normal, but something happened when all of a sudden it just right. shot up. Uh, and she spent several years in a wheelchair recovering from that, uh, did not have health issues before that, but then it, it just happened. That's right. And, and the problem with stroke is, you know, the price you pay for your stroke can be very high. You know, they can be fatal. We see people who die of their stroke, mm -hmm. as, as witnessed here, complications of a stroke, Mr. Singleton. What, how do we avert uh, you talked about uh, hypertension, high blood pressure. Right. What else? What else can be done for us uh, where we are not in that situation uh, to actually have a stroke? So lifestyle modification, the best we can in 2019, avoiding tobacco, cutting mm -hmm. out the tobacco, um, watching that diet. You know, low salt, low fat, low fried foods. You know, Greensboro, North Carolina, is in the stroke belt. And when you look at obesity and you look at some of the other things that occur, they follow track along right aside of stroke. And so a healthy lifestyle goes a long way. So, so one of the things that folks should all should be doing is obviously what you just mentioned, but also constantly, you know, I always uh, say you, you should constantly, you should know your number. Right. You should constantly get your blood pressure checked. That's right. Uh, I, I was at a church in Dallas, and uh, we had a nurses' ministry, and they offered uh, free free blood pressure checks after church on Sunday. All That's you, right. And now these were the same nurses who worked at the Baylor College of Medicine. Right. Uh, and uh, I would, and, and I'm going, guys, it's free. That's right. And I'm going, if you, I'm like, if you get sick, right. This is what you're going to do. That's right. You, you go, I mean, you're going to have to see the same nurses. That's right. And the number of people who literally would not stop just for those two minutes. And then one day, so I'm, I'm out there haranguing people to you know, come get it done. Right. The nurses, nurses ministry loved me doing it. And that was, a, that was an African-American woman, she had two kids. And one of the young kids, uh, it took his blood pressure. She says, you need to go to the hospital. She says, oh, I'll go to the doctor tomorrow. She says, no, 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 you need to go now. Right. Her child had his bloodshot eyes mm -hmm. and blood, the, the child's blood pressure was sky high. Right. They said, mm -hmm. no, you need to go now. Right. Had they not caught, caught it then, it could have right. been devastating for their child. That's right. But again, for so many people, they just, they wouldn't do it. It's That's free. Right. That's right. And going out to the public, I think is important. American Heart Association recognizes that. You're starting to see barbershops now where you can have your blood pressure checked when you get your hair cut. Because people aren't always going to just come into my clinic and say, hey, you know, I don't think I have any health issues, but let's check your blood, check my blood pressure and see. Right. I get mine checked. Look, if uh, I don't, I, look, I was in line at a bank. Right. And they had f free blood pressure. I'm like, first of all, it's free. That's right. Uh, and so I'm all I'm always getting mine checked because when I've had sinus infection and when I, when all of a sudden I got it checked and if it was one forward, I would go, hold up. That's high. Right. Because I knew what my number it consistently That's right. been. That's right. And it's just for so many people. It, it's just the hardest thing in the world to get somebody to say, guys. It, just know your blood pressure number. That's right. And that way you're constantly getting a check. If you hear it's 135 or 140, you go, wait a minute, hold up. I'm That's normally right. 110 or 115. That's right. 
Exactly right. And so, you know, you go to a pharmacy, you go to Walmart, you go to these kind of places. Often, you know, YMCA, you can put your arm in there, you get that blood pressure checked. And that's key. That's really important. I think something that's really crucial, too, is to know the signs and symptoms of a stroke. And what are they? So that you can help your family member. You right. know, if someone, so if that person all of a sudden, they just can't comprehend what you're saying. Yep. They can't speak. They're trying, but the words just that happened aren't to one of my aunts at my out. birthday party. Yep. Right. Sometimes you'll see a facial droop. All of a sudden, you know, auntie's left face is drooping all of a sudden, and she doesn't even know. Bring it to her attention. Go look in the mirror with her. You know, sometimes we can't move one side of our body mm -hmm. or we can't feel one side of our body. We have numbness. Um, our vision is blurred or all of a sudden we have kind of tunnel vision, you know, or we can only see out of one eye or, you know, I don't even recognize someone's to the left of me anymore. You know, well, what, what is a mini stroke? Because I, I've heard that from some doctors, if some people have mini strokes. Right. So, you know, there are lots of terms that we throw around in medicine. So a stroke, by definition, means that some of the brain cells have died because they didn't get adequate blood flow. Mm -hmm. We would all agree a massive stroke, you know, is one where we have profound deficits. Our body, we can't move our left side. We're like you described with your friend. They're in a wheelchair and they, it takes years to get over. That's a massive stroke. A mini stroke means it, you know, was a small stroke, maybe to a, a smaller territory of the brain or that it just resolved quickly and we didn't have the deficits or the long-term mm -hmm. paralysis or weakness or numbness. Um, we often also describe what are called TIAs, transient ischemic attacks. Mm -hmm. And what that means is basically you had symptoms, they were real, they were legit, they resolved on their own typically within about 24 hours and when later we go back and we do an MRI or head CT, we don't see any evidence of it. it. It's completely resolved, we call that a transient ischemic attack. All right. Dr. Allred, we certainly appreciate it. I hate we have to chat with you under these circumstances, but it's, uh, I mean, with the passing of John Singleton to a stroke, and it's certainly what we're doing here with the American Heart Association, uh, this initiative they're doing to uh, get better health outcomes for African Americans, partner with HBCUs, is certainly yeah. uh, is timely and important. And thanks for being here and, and supporting the event and, and helping to get the word out. We appreciate that. All right. Thanks a bunch. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right. All right, folks. Again, uh, John Singleton, uh, 51 years old. He had five children. I uh, was a graduate of the United of the USC uh, film school there. And so uh, it is uh, just, again, just r really sad, a really sad story. Uh, John was a really, really uh, great guy, somebody who um, was, again, um, so supportive, uh, loving of so many other people as well. I mentioned 2017 uh, interviewing him at the American Black Film Festival. Uh, and so there were actually a couple of interviews that I did, one on stage, another was an interview that I did with him uh, that we did off stage, excuse me, that was a part of my TV One show, uh, News One Now. He was uh, launching, uh, he, was, he debuted his show, uh, Snowfall, which was aired on, airs on FX Network there uh, at ABFF in 2017. And here was my conversation with the great John Singleton. It's nice to just really, you know, see different, different visions of, of what African-American filmmakers are wanting to do and aspiring to do. And also the talent, you know, there's a talent pool. The talent pool comes all the way over. There's, there's people here that aren't necessarily going to go and move to L.A., to make it in the business. They come here for a few days and we are supposed to like be of service to them, to give them advice or whatever. So I don't mind like, you know, I come down and I just hold court sometimes and just talk to scores of folks and everything, you know. Um, you know, that's what it's about. Also relationships. In terms yes, of being exactly. able to, it's just, there's nothing like when you meet people and, and you're having just regular, ordinary conversation and you're yes. building a rapport. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and that's what, I mean, that's what um, any type of, of I guess, movement needs is, is, is support from, from, from different levels. You know, it's not a really about that whole thing of like, oh, I got my own mind and I'm not trying to let nobody else in. We need as many people as possible to realize their dreams and tell their stories, you know, to really have it even more of a stronger hold on, on what this is. Because this media is so powerful, you know, film and television is so powerful, it has a the ability to shape and form the way people think about themselves, first of all, individually, and then collectively. So we need people who are coming into this with a certain kind of mindset of, of what they want to do, but they understand, you know, they can follow my example or someone else's example that they really admire and say, hey, you know, listen, this person is a person of integrity. They have a certain clear clarity of vision. And, you know, if I follow that, maybe I'll, I'll make it. John Maxwell um, has tons of leadership books. He 
uh, holds his conferences, and there are a lot of people who worked under him, mm -hmm. who he has said, it's time for you to go. Mm -hmm. And they've gone out, done their own thing, has given their blessings, mm -hmm. and they still are crediting him for that. Yes. When, when you look at your career, how does it make you feel when you're able to say, uh, they got their first shot on one of my projects? I mean, I don't they, even look at it like that. I just look at it. I don't even. I don't even go back to any of that stuff. It's just like, I, um, I was inspired by people. You know, I was inspired by, by several filmmakers. You know, Gordon Parks, um, and then Spike Lee, who I met just when I was in high school, going to college. You know, and I hope that I was able to service that for other people, for other filmmakers to do good work and stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, that is not not being inspired, but giving somebody the shot. Yeah. A lot of people say, if, man, if I could just get a shot. Uh -huh. But being for you being in a position to give somebody that shot, uh, and, then that see them, <laughs> and then you see them years later. I love it. I love it. It's beautiful. I love it. You know, I love it. I mean, um, you know, well, my good friend Ice Cube, you know, he, he started off with me as an actor and then he became a, a writer, producer. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? Now, writer, producer, entrepreneur, entrepreneur yeah, own yeah. the whole company. Exactly. Thing. You know, I love it. I love it. Directing is one thing. Folks got to know you through directing Boys in the Hood. But one of the things that um, you I've noticed and what you've done is you said, okay, that's one piece. Mm -hmm. But the ability to be able either to be an executive producer or producer to be involved in other aspects of the business. Yes, exactly. Well, how critical is that? It's very critical. For, for me, you know, I write first and foremost because writing is the blueprint for everything. I write, direct, and produce. So, um, I just really think that if you really have, if you really want to have an all-encompassing vision of what you want to do, you have to really start at the root of story. You know what I mean? Story and a story has to have a reason to be told. You know, um, whether or not it's a personal issue or it's something that um, is affecting a lot of people, whatever, it has to have uh, come from a, a genuine place of passion. And I always come from. That's all with me. It's all about a genuine place of passion. So what you working on now? Um, I have a new show out, um, coming out called Snowfall. Um, it's on FX Networks. It premieres July the 5th. And um, it's a story about how cocaine uh, changed uh, uh, America, but changed LA first and foremost. Frankie! Franklin Saint, king of all the white boys. I'm here to buy. I don't sell coke to kids. And what do you sell? You sell kilos to people with money. 50 kilos worth of cocaine hidden in a hot tub. I'm a soldier, not a drug dealer. So what are we talking about? How badly does the director want this war funded? Uh, is it uh, based on any real person? Or no, it's a, all fictional. A collection? It's all fictional. It's a personal story for me because I grew up in South Central Los Angeles, as everybody knows, and see my movies. Um, um, but this is about how the, how the, the proliferation facilitated by the CIA mm -hmm. of cheap cocaine went to Los Angeles. Thank you, Gary Webb, the late <laughs> Gary Webb. And, and how that started the crack epidemic. So, you, you know, this is before cocaine. The show starts before cocaine, and you, the snowfall is the storm, you know. Mm -hmm. it, there's a storm coming. I've been telling people there's a storm coming, and it's cocaine, you know. And with the, with the cheap cocaine, you know, they were able to, to basically, people were able to formulate and make, make crack. You know what I mean? They put it on us, but it, it, was, it was something that was, you know, it wasn't invented by us at all. All right, folks, on yesterday in Detroit, we also lost a, another huge giant. That is federal judge Damon J. Keith. Uh, he, uh, a legal lion, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., tweeted uh, that when you look at uh, African-Americans in law, Thurgood Marshall, Leon Higginbotham, Constance Baker Motley, uh, Damon Keith uh, belongs in that particular group. Uh, a major, major uh, judge who would, was still hearing cases at the age of 96, uh, critical rulings uh, in Detroit, uh, rulings all across the country, uh, rule against President Richard Nixon when it came to wiretapping. That case uh, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and it was a unanimous uh, decision rendered uh, affirming uh, Judge Keith's, um, uh, affirming his uh, ruling. He also was the co-founder of the NAACP Freedom Fund Dinner in Detroit, the largest in the country. Uh, he also, uh, Alpha, brother of mine as well, very much involved uh, in Alpha Phi Alpha there in Detroit. 
Detroit and all across the country. Joining us right now is Spencer Overton. Spencer, uh, president for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, uh, the leading black think tank in the country. Uh, Spencer also was one of uh, the law clerks to serve under Judge Keith. Uh, Spencer, you and I talked this morning, the Tom Jordan Morning Show. For folks who do not know about Judge Keith, don't understand how powerful he was, his impact, uh, what did he mean to you personally? Oh, well, he was just amazing, uh, Roland. Thank you so much for, for profiling him. He's one of the most significant federal judges in the history of our nation. Part of it is these landmark legal rulings, standing up to President Nixon and saying you need a warrant if you want a wiretap, uh, standing up to the Bush administration and saying democracies die behind closed doors and opening up these deportation hearings in the aftermath of 911, uh, standing up for, for, for black folks here. That's part of it. But another part, Roland, is this notion of he's just got a whole group of clerks just being a mentor to people who are great lawyers around the country, having this network of people. It wasn't just about Judge Keith, it was about what he taught these young lawyers who came to work for him and who are now doing things like running civil rights organizations or the U.S. attorney or uh, judges now or the first black uh, a female law professor at Harvard Law School. Uh, you know, he made his legacy there. And then he stepped up in terms of the community. Rosa Parks, you know, there's a break in at her house. She's assaulted. He moves her out to an apartment building that has security. The uh, African American Museum in Detroit going underwater because of financial problems. Judge Keith convenes the people who eventually raise the money to save the museum. You mentioned the Freedom Fund dinner. He stepped up to the plate consistently for the community. Uh, one of the things, we talk about those legal rulings. Uh, look, I mean, he, uh, how he impacted uh, hiring there in Detroit with uh, wielding uh, that gavel. A lot of people don't understand the power of federal judges. Uh, it's not just where they are appointed, where they rule. Uh, their rulings also uh, can be uh, national. Th that's right. Certainly when he stopped Nixon from wiretapping people without a warrant, that was something that was national here. Uh, Pontiac, uh, school desegregation, basically uh, schools were segregated because real estate agents uh, engaged in discriminatory housing practices. He basically put an end to that with busing. People went nuts. The Klan bombed some buses. Judge Keith just stepped up to the plate and held his course in terms of that issue. Uh, several discrimination cases in terms of the Detroit Police Department, uh, Detroit Edison. Again, Judge Keith steps up. He rules just not just in the right way, but orders affirmative action plans. He's got some really big decisions decisions and then he's not afraid. He just had a dissent in a voting rights case a few years ago in Ohio where he actually added pictures of people who were lynched, black folks who were lynched, to the opinion to illustrate, hey, this isn't a long time ago. This is real when we talk about suppressing the votes and there are real motives behind it. He, again, he was just so courageous and stepped up to the plate and certainly thoughtful and being thoughtful is, is great. There are a lot of smart people, but he was also courageous. Uh, last question for you, uh, and, and that is, uh, we were at the Supreme Court two years ago during the March on Washington Film Festival, uh, where there was a Q&A that took place between him and former Attorney General Eric Holder. There also was the airing of a documentary on the life of uh, Judge Keith. And what, what was very interesting uh, about that conversation, and that was two years ago, he was a man at the time who was 94 years old, right. still sharp as a tack, and someone who was very concerned about the lack of diversity on the federal bench. You look at what Donald Trump is doing right now, and the people who he's appointing, he is largely appointing uh, white right-wing conservatives to the bench. 90% uh, of them are white men. Uh, America is changing. And Keith understood why you needed different, different groups, different ethnicities, uh, diversity on the federal bench. 
Yeah, he, he did. He understood that. He was a mentor to many judges. If you look at Court of Appeals judges, they all look up to Judge, judge Keith. He was the dean of federal judges. And also, both in terms of judges and, again, these clerks, he's hired more clerks of color than any federal judge in the history of the United States. He understood the importance of diversity in decision-making and, and being at, at, at the plate there. Let me just also say this. He never forgot where he came came from. This guy was Judge Keith. He was a grandson of slaves. He was mopping floors at the Detroit News in the bathroom when he found out he passed the bar. He just kind of came from nowhere and, and really rose to the highest levels of the profession. And again, he brought us all along with him. He's just a, a great model. Uh, that documentary you mentioned, it's called Walk With Me. If you go on YouTube or anything else and just, just Google Walk With Me, you can see the trailer. And then there's a book on Judge Keith's life called Crusader for Justice. Uh, and if you just look online and, and Google Crusader for Justice, uh, you'll, you'll see the book. All right, then, Spencer Overton, uh, President, Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. We certainly appreciate you sharing your thoughts about, uh, again, uh, the late federal judge uh, Damon J. Keith passed and, and away and, yesterday at the age of 96. And, and Roland, ahead. let me just also say thank you though, for how you use your platform. I mean, this is so important in terms of the black community and black folks, and this is such a major loss. And just thank you so much for the way you use your platform. You're an incredibly important voice. I appreciate it, Spencer. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, folks. So early this, uh, actually, uh, late last night, uh, I was uh, tweeting uh, again. Former Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, he was traveling today and was unable to join me uh, with Spencer the Tom Journal Morning Show. But I do want to read what what he tweeted out. He tweeted out: Judge Damon Keith was a great lawyer, activist, and became an icon, a hero to so many. This nation is indebted to him for the work he did to make America more just. Democracy dies in the dark was written by this great man. That phrase is so relevant today. And that was a tweet that Eric Holder uh, sent out uh, yesterday uh, about Damon J. Keith. As I said, Eric Holder uh, is actually traveling, and so he wanted to join us to talk about uh, Judge Keith. Hopefully, uh, we're going to be able to uh, get him uh, uh, later uh, this week to talk about uh, his impact. Also, uh, we're going to also peruse my archives. I do recall uh, when I was hosting an event uh, for the Michigan delegation during the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Judge Keith was one of the folks uh, who spoke uh, some very strong words that he spoke there as well. And so phenomenal, phenomenal man uh, who understood his purpose, understood his calling. Uh, we certainly wanted to pay homage to him. Uh, and again, uh, losing on one hand, here you have a young man, John Singleton, 51, uh, member of Kappa Alpha Psi. Then, of course, you got Judge Damon Keith, an alpha, died at the age of 96. And so we wanted to, wanted to certainly pay homage to both of them. And over the next, over this week, uh, we're going to continue to have our more memorials paid to both of these uh, gentlemen uh, as we also get details of their funeral. Uh, of course, talking about J J Judge Keith, talking about the issue of voting rights. Uh, there's a case uh, in Texas that's critically important. Uh, voting rights advocates sued the Texas Secretary of State over his attempt to question the citizenship status of nearly 100,000 voters. He wanted local election officials to send letters demanding they prove their citizenship but most were actual naturalized citizens and, of course, black folks and others of color. The Secretary of State, a Republican, of course, David Whitley, knew he'd lose in court, so late last week he settled the case. He agreed to stop pushing for the citizenship review, and the state is to pay nearly a half a million dollars in lawyers' fees and court costs. The courts have always been a partner in preserving voting rights and civil rights, and that's always been the case and will continue to be the case if we also vote. And here's the other piece, though. This Republican in Texas, my home state, literally wasted half a million dollars of taxpayer money on something that he knew he was going to lose. I keep trying to tell folks this, and you better understand it. You're going to see a continuing attack on the voting rights of African Americans and other people of color in this country by Republicans all across this nation. They understand the impact of 2020, and folks had better understand that you sitting on the sidelines cannot do anything when it comes to defending democracy. There's no perfect candidate, but I dare say this here, 
anybody is better than Donald Trump and the kind of people who he's leading all across this country. And so we must remain vigilant, and you can expect us on this show to, to remain vigilant and speak to these issues as it relates to voting rights and voter suppression. And every time there's an effort uh, to hurt our voting rights, we are going to go after those who do so. All right, folks, got to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the American Heart Association, uh, what they're doing here in Greensboro, North Carolina, with HBCUs to improve healthy outcomes for African Americans. I'll be back on Roller Martin on the Filter in just a moment. You are not judged from the height you have risen, but from the depth you have climbed. Abolitionist and autobiographer Frederick Douglass. All right, folks, Roland Martin here. Uh, I am here uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, the International Civil Rights Museum. But here's the piece. Uh, normally, this is where we do our hashtag HBCU Giving Day School. We had another school, but we're actually uh, in the old Woolworth building. This museum is located where the first lunch counter sit-in took place, led by four students from North Carolina A&T. And so that's one of the reasons that we are here. And so we wanted to give uh, them a shout out. Uh, and so that's actually going to be our HBCU Giving Day School today, uh, North Carolina A&T. Again, we want to thank those four students, four freshmen, uh, who chose to come to this Woolworth and sit down. It was what they did that sparked a wildfire all across the South uh, as black college students at HBCUs uh, integrated uh, lunch counters all across the South uh, that particular summer in 1960. And so we certainly appreciate uh, what they did. Uh, folks, we are here. Uh, because the American Heart Association, uh, they have been, uh, they have launched an initiative to deal with the issue, to confront the reality of healthy outcomes for African Americans. Uh, it is a critical issue, as we all know. Uh, and so what they're doing is they're actually having a competition where five HBCUs will present solutions to remove barriers to health. Joining me to talk about it is Empowered to Serve supporter, uh, Mark Moore. Mark, how you doing? I'm fine. Hi, nice right, to meet Glad you. to have you here. Same here. Uh, so first and foremost, um, obviously, when you look at where African Americans are going, HBCU attendance is up across the country. And when you look at where do most black doctors come from, they could come from HBCUs as well. When you look at the stats, African Americans are more likely to get better health outcomes when they have black doctors yes. as opposed to white doctors. Uh, and so how, how critical is this particular initiative when you talk about partnering with American Heart Association and HBCUs to improve healthy outcomes for African Americans? I think this is very critical. Um, and all those statistics you, you just repeated are absolutely right on spot on, uh, Roland. The fact of the matter is what's happening here at HBCUs is critically important. I particularly, as an entrepreneur, I love this because we're coming to HBCU. These are bright, innovative people. There's no better way to find a solution to our health issues today than talk to these young people. They're bright. They're innovative. They have the, the will and the power to solve this problem. It's also a tapping into that knowledge and talent. Look, I, I can tell you a lot of times when I see these stories being talked about, oh, there'll, there'll be somebody and there'll be an African-American. They might be from Princeton or Yale or from Harvard. Mm -hmm. But the reality is uh, when you look at the talent that exists, when you look at the knowledge, uh, a lot of these people are walking past many of these HBCUs, not just Meharry Medical School, not just Xavier in New Orleans, uh, but uh, Morehouse. Uh, the, the, they're walking past Spelman, they're walking past uh, Howard University, they're walking past places where you have some really talented folks who can do more to impact the health of African Americans if they just get a shot. Absolutely. You know, and they are motivated to help solve this problem, obviously, because they are African Americans. You know, you know Roland, I just w went through and walked through a bunch of the finalists and listened to presentations, and you are spot on. These are bright, innovative, creative people that will absolutely find a solution to the health problems that we, not just African Americans, but as a society that we face today. So you say that you're an entrepreneur. What is the line of business you're in? I was in telecom, in, in the telecom business, um, providing uh, what we call, um, it, it call internet protocol support to the Department of Defense. Uh, and so how did you get involved in this with the American Heart Association? Well, it's funny, um, not, not really funny, but interesting. I am a stroke survivor, so this is near and dear to my heart. Um, what these folks are doing in terms of research, 
work and advocacy is very, very important. And I want people to realize that even though, in my case, I suffered a stroke and I've been very fortunate to have a full recovery, it can happen, and I want people to know that. How long ago did you have a stroke? Um, that was in 2007. 2007. Mm -hmm. and, and were you focused on health issues prior to that? Now, and then after that, did you say, you know what? I want to use my resources and my impact to, to, to make a difference. And Roland, you said absolutely correct. I really wasn't. You know, as an entrepreneur, I was focused on the business, right? And I was, I was trying to, I had a wonderful business and trying to get up and running. And unfortunately, I came down with two strokes and had major two brain strokes. Two strokes. Wow. And had major brain surgery. But with the grace, with God's grace, I've had a full recovery. And you're right, Roland. I was moved to say, look, I got to make a difference. I need to help others just as these young people here are trying to do. And I'm trying to help them find solutions to these problems. All right, then. Well, again, we got five HBCUs yes. uh, that are finalists. And folks, this is going to happen. Uh, well, once we finish with the live broadcast of this show, uh, then we're going to, of course, stop. And they're going to restart our live stream. I'm going to be actually hosting uh, and uh, moderating uh, the whole presentation. And so you're going to be able to hear the presentations uh, of all of these, uh, these five finalists. Uh, and then they're going to actually uh, pick a winner. And so, Mark, we appreciate uh, your support for this. Thank you, uh, thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Thank you All very right, much. then. All right, again, folks, and so uh, I talked about this particular uh, contest, and that's what it is, the contest. Uh, then you also have, of course, uh, judges in the contest and who are going to be, uh, of course, uh, judging these particular schools. And so I want to sit here and uh, want to talk, talk about that. Uh, go ahead, grab the mic, please. Uh, so, Rhonda, how are you doing? I'm fine, Roland. How are you? All right, so you got five schools that are finalists, okay? How were they picked? Where, where did they, where did, like, what, were you a bunch of other schools uh, who sure applied? Was. What happened? So the Mid-Atlantic affiliate is D.C., Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina. And we're piloting it here this year. And in our affiliate alone, there are 29 HBCUs. We went through a process of soliciting their applications, and then we sent it through our Center for Evaluation and Metrics. So we're a science-based organization. What they looked at is which projects had the most potential for scale, for sustainability, and for impact on the community. And that's how we chose our top five. So, um, so first of all, how long? So, whoever wins, how long is this grant or uh, this, this initiative? How long is it? The grant is for a hundred thousand dollars, and it's for two years. So, they have a total of two years to implement their strategies, both on the campus and in the community. Okay, and so, so for them, it, it would be campus and the community. Yes, sir. Okay, why both? We picked HBCUs because they're really critically important to our communities, and I mean our African-American communities. They were created as land-grant institutions. I learned that from your shows, listening <laughs> to you in the morning. And it started me thinking about who is best able to serve and provide resources to the communities that surround these campuses. So the way we designed the project was not just for them to focus on what's important to transform their lives, but to take them out into the community and make them change agents and start transforming the lives of the people who live around them. Uh, and it was very interesting, so the fact that we, we started this show talking about the death of John Singleton, uh, who passed away uh, yeah. due to a stroke. Uh, Mark, uh, who, of course, uh, your entrepreneur, uh, who uh, is also a financial supporter of this, uh, talked about him suffering uh, too yes. as well. And uh, for, uh, for so many African Americans, what I keep saying is, when you don't know, you don't know. You don't know. Uh, and so what's also important is by having black folks speaking to these issues, African Americans are more likely to trust someone African American yes. uh, when it comes to their health. That is so correct. One of the things we know is important with this initiative, and for the Heart Association in general, we say this all the time, we've got to start listening to communities. We don't know all the solutions. We don't know what they need all the time or how they want to receive the help. So what we're being is authentic. We're authentically saying we care, we want to help you, but you need to tell us mm -hmm. what's important to you and what you need to make your lives better. Now, and that's what this is now you say this is the Mid-Atlantic. Yes. Uh, any plans to actually do this other parts of the country? Sure are. So we're piloting the HBU, HBCU strategy. But as you heard on your show earlier this week, Pamela Garman Johnson and our national team is also implementing a national accelerator. And that will be taking place in October. So we're looking at entrepreneurs and community change agents 
from whatever spectrum they're coming from. So it could be a nurse, a doctor, could be a, a policeman we had last year. We've always had a lot of students, though, and that's really what inspired this HBCU track. Uh, I mentioned Mark, but also uh, Mr. Uh, John Houston yes. is also one of your supporters. Yeah, and I'm so pleased with both Mark and John's support because, again, going back to being authentic, who better to support and offer support to these universities than other African-American leaders and philanthropists that have taken their entrepreneurial spirit and transformed communities and their jobs and their lives. So we're really happy to have both Mark and John as part of this initiative. Uh, and again, for the folks, uh, how can I get more information sure. uh, on this particular initiative, but also the American Heart Association? So for this particular initiative, please visit www.empowertoserve.org, and you'll learn more about our national accelerator. The applications just opened May 1, mm -hmm. and we encourage any entrepreneur out there that's interested. So anybody can enter. Anybody in the country can enter this competition to go online to that site and submit your ideas for transformation. And what's the site again? www.empowertoserve.org. All right, Ronald, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ronald. All right, thank you very much. Uh, again, folks, we're here at the International Civil Rights Museum located in Greensboro, North Carolina, site of the old Woolworths. Uh, that's where uh, uh, we are. And so here's going to happen. Uh, once we end Roland Martin Unfiltered, uh, we're going to then go into their theater uh, where the competition will actually take place. You will actually get uh, to hear uh, exact, actually get to hear all the different presentations. Uh, and so that's one of the things that uh, we will do uh, in uh, just a moment. What I need to also uh, l uh, let you know is that uh, you need to also be uh, letting all of your folks know, the HBCUs uh, that are participating. We also, again, there are five HBCUs uh, that are involved in this particular competition. Uh, so you have Bennett College, uh, Howard University, Johnson C. Smith University, uh, you have Winston-Salem State University, and you also have Virginia State University. So I'm quite sure uh, my alpha brother, who's the president of Virginia State, uh, is certainly interested uh, in how his, his school is going to perform. Uh, I'm about to do an interview real quick with a couple of the folks involved. Uh, how y'all doing? So the three of you are going to be judging the competition? All right, start over here with your name. Just hold the microphone up to his name. Hey, uh, Aaron Levy from Raise the Bar. Emily Dickens from Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. And John Dozier from the University of South Carolina. All right, then. And so uh, the three of you have, have to will this thing down. Uh, so what are you looking for? So I think what we're looking for is our, our good community um, student projects, projects where that benefit both the students um, and, and the universities while also benefiting the communities that they exist in um, and making sure that they're solving real problems uh, real health, health equities that uh, inequities that are occurring within their neighborhoods. Looking for sustainability. It's going to be important that whatever is funded today is continues to be funded, and that there's some mechanism to do so. Um, I'm looking to identify the problem, the solution, the focus, and the team. How they're actually going to make this real and make it happen. Last question for all of you, because I know we're about to walk in here uh, to get started. Uh, how important is it to also have we listen to? Uh, young voices who might approach this differently than folks who are older. I, I think that's one of the things we've been talking about all day is that that's probably the most important thing to me is having a different perspective on a problem that we've been facing in America for hundreds of years uh, and these students are going to represent different perspectives and different ideas for how to do that. Great. Well, for me, I mean, it's really about this is why I'm excited about the fact that the American Heart Association is doing this work is because they're getting our young folks involved in thinking about how do they solve problems uh, that uh, exist within their communities in ways that, again, are going to help them to learn and grow while uh, helping the communities as well. I'll see you all in about 20 minutes in the, in the theater. All right. Thanks I appreciate so it. Thanks so much. Uh, again, folks, so we certainly appreciate uh, the folks with the American Heart Association uh, partnering with us to actually do this as well. Uh, and it, 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 it is amazing but also sad in terms of how timely it is uh, partnering with them on this health initiative uh, losing uh, a great giant a talent li talent like John Singleton uh, but it also allows us to speak to the issue of healthy outcomes for African Americans so that's critically important for us uh, to be able to do so one of the things that we frequently do on this show one of the things that we're going to continue to do so uh, providing you more information 
uh, because we want to be able to live longer, healthier lives. Uh, we want to be able to see black men uh, living longer as well. And so uh, over the next several days, we'll certainly have information for you about the funeral services uh, for John Singleton, also for uh, Judge Damon Keith, who passed away on yesterday in Detroit at the age of 96. So I want to end today's show uh, with a, a snippet of the interview that I did with John Singleton at the, on the stage at the American Black Film Festival uh, in 2017. Uh, and uh, I'll see you guys in just a bit as we do our live stream from here. Uh, but uh, apropos uh, to hear from uh, John Singleton, a really great guy, a great man, an unbelievable director. Talk about that process of guiding someone else through and do, do you sometimes want to grab the reins or do you tell yourself no, you no, need to put... Never, I don't want to grab, I mean, I have, if I work with somebody, I respect them enough to know that they can ride the horse on their own, but I'm there to teach them how to ride and, you know, and go from zero, like go from just learning how to really ride, as I say when directing, you know, ride horse to actually being like, one of the damn Kentucky Bergen, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I hold them the same standard that I hold myself to when I'm, when I'm doing something. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered? The blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. Martin. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. <laughs>